Well, thank you very much for having me, and uh, it's wonderful for all of you to come and listen, and uh, I hope we have an interesting afternoon of nudging ahead of us. Um, let me first uh, remind you that uh, much of what I'm going to say today is, uh, is based on my book that was uh, written with a very good friend of mine, Cass Sunstein, uh, who was a colleague of mine at the University of Chicago for many years and is now uh, working for his former friend and colleague at our law school, uh, President Obama. Uh, Cass's job, well, he has, the title of his job is quite boring. It's, he's the Director of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. But uh, the, the media call him the Regulation Czar, and I call him the Nudger in Chief. And um, so um, uh, Cass is busy um, implementing these ideas, and uh, he sends me around to uh, spread the gospel. So, uh, and this is a good place for spreading the gospel. So um, let me start by saying what our goals were in writing this book. And, and we thought of them as uh, we had two ambitious goals. The first, uh, the first ambitious goal was to try and create a framework for thinking about public policy and uh, that employed the ideas of behavioral economics and, uh, and could possibly uh, show how these ideas could be applied to many of the important problems that face the world today. So this was the merely ambitious goal. The, ridiculously ambitious goal was to create a framework that could somehow span the political debates that at least in America are becoming increasingly polarized between the left and the right. And we tried to create a framework that might be acceptable to both sides. And um, as was mentioned in the introduction, there's some glimmer of Hope for that. Um, both Cass and I have worked um, on behalf of the Obama team and campaign, and um, I've now been named as an advisor to David Cameron, who's from the Conservative Party, and the president of South Korea, who's actually uh, quite conservative, has also read the book and assigned it to his cabinet. So we're hoping that m maybe this this hope that we had of spanning the political divide might possibly work. So um, let me start by saying what is behavioral economics and let me offer a definition from Herb Simon who was really a predecessor of the, of the current field. And uh, he, he rightly says that the name seems a little odd. He calls it a pleonasm, you don't have to be embarrassed not to know what that word means. It, it means a redundant phrase. And he, he rightly says, well, one might wonder why we need that term. Isn't economics about behavior after all? And so why do we need a special branch that, uh, that does behavioral economics? And uh, he correctly says, well, the answer to that lies in the assumptions of economics. So what are those assumptions of standard economics and how do they differ uh, in behavioral economics? In our book, we talk about two kinds of creatures. There are humans, like most of the people in this room, and then there are imaginary creatures that appear primarily in economics articles and textbooks. Uh, they're sometimes called by the Latin term homo economicus, but we just call them econs. And the difference between behavioral economics and other parts of economics is that behavioral economists study humans and the rest of the field studies econs. And uh, now, what's the difference between a human and an econ? 
Well, humans are boundedly rational, to use Simon's term. What does that mean? It means that, uh, well, again, the contrast is what helps. An, an econ can look at an array of complicated financial instruments, immediately figure out which one has the highest value, and choose it without error. Um, a human has trouble doing long division if he doesn't have a calculator handy. Um, humans also have limited attention spans. Econs are always on target. Sometimes we humans have our minds wander. The second important principle is that humans have self-control problems. Econs never do. E econs, uh, econs have never had a hangover, uh, are never overweight, and um, never uh, splurge on a big TV or a pair of shoes that they don't really need. Um, so uh, they're actually not much fun, these econs. <laughs> The, the, the third characteristic of econs uh, is they are unboundedly unscrupulous. Um, for them, every interaction is strategic. So normally, if somebody just asks you what time it is, you just look at your watch and you say, well, it's 2.20. Um, an econ, suppose you were outside waiting for the talk to begin, and somebody says what time it is, if you're an econ, you say, hmm, well, what would be the strategically best response to this query? And you might say, well, if I lie and say it's only two, then I'll get a better seat in the auditorium. So econs are always uh, striving to one-up the other person. Fortunately, humans are a little nicer than that. Now, the final aspect of behavioral economics that makes behavioral economics different from psychology and some of the other fields it draws upon is it is about economics. I've spent met much of my career in the last 20 years studying financial markets and how they differ from the perfect markets that some of my University of Chicago colleagues uh, write about and dream about. Um, I'm not going to talk about the efficient market hypothesis today per se, but I, instead I'm merely going to show a single picture that I claim is the single best evidence against the basic principle that drives efficient market theory, which is the law of one price. So let me just show you that photo. Now. This photograph was taken in Buenos Aires. Some of my economist colleagues claim this is not a violation of the law of one price. This is rational discrimination against Americans who are too stupid to know the Spanish for orange juice and too stupid to notice that the photographs of the oranges are identical. Uh, but. Uh, at least until the end, this is all I'm going to have to say about financial markets. So the approach that Cass and I take is what we call libertarian paternalism, or what might uh, in Europe better be called liberal paternalism. Um, and at least in the US, both halves of this expression are quite unpopular. Um, so why do we combine two unpopular, uh, contradictory terms and write a book about that? We think when combined, uh, the terms are both compatible and maybe even lovable. So by libertarian or liberal, all we mean is we try to devise policies that maintain freedom of choice. So we don't tell people, you must do this or you must not do that. Um, we try to give them a choice. By paternalism, we simply mean devising policies that are aimed at making people better off as judged by themselves. So it's not that Cass and I 
think we know what's best for other people or that we think Barack Obama or David Cameron know what's best for other people. We think that we can help people make the choices they would make if they had all the information and time necessary to make a good choice. How do we do it? We do it using uh, choice architecture, which is a, a phrase we coined while writing this book. So what is a choice architect? Choice architect is anyone who designs the environment in which choices are made. So suppose you go to a restaurant and the chef has decided what things he's going to cook that night. There's someone else whose job it is to produce a menu. And there are decisions to make. How to group the, the food that's going to be served. Should, cold appetizers and hot appetizers be in separate categories. And within each category, uh, what's the order of the food? Well, would, one would think that uh, those things wouldn't matter, but psychology tells us that they all matter. So here's the most important point I'm going to make today. You must choose something. Consider the following example that we use to motivate our book. Suppose that the director of school cafeterias for the, the Netherlands um, discovers that the order in which the food is displayed in school cafeterias influences what the kids eat. What use should be made of that information? How, she now knows that. How should she arrange the food? Well, she could try to arrange the food to make the kids healthier or fatter. Or she could fool herself into thinking that she can avoid choice architecture, perhaps by arranging the food at random. But of course, that in and of itself would be a choice and one that would slow the lines down because people would have no idea. Imagine if the bread is in one place and the things to put in the bread are in a completely different place. Um, it, it could take hours to, to find your lunch. Uh, or you could use the strategy of lining your pockets. So the uh, feature the items for which she gets the largest bribes. The, uh, you can decide which of these you like best. If you like the first one, then you can join the liberal paternalism party with us. Um, you can be the third and fourth members uh, uh, after Cass and me. Um, and, but again, the point I want to stress is that you must choose something. It's not possible to have a neutral choice architecture any more than it's possible to have neutral architecture. The architect who built this church had some constraints, probably the size of this room and the physical location, but there were all kinds of other decisions and they influence um, the way we enjoy the room. Now, the next point to make is that some designs are better than others. Chances are you have a stove at home that looks like this. Uh, you have four burners and four knobs. And if you want to turn on the left rear burner, you have to turn one of those knobs on the left. Uh, if you're sitting in the back, you probably can't read the labels on the two burners, which puts you into the same situation as someone my age that's looking down at the stove. And I find when I'm using that stove at home, I'm about 60-40 to turn on the right knob, uh, which is better than chance, but only slightly. Now, compare that to this stove that we haven't even labeled the knobs, but no one would ever make a mistake. So we have a good design and a bad design, and our point is, why not choose good designs? Which brings me to the most famous Dutch 
contribution to choice architecture. Uh, now, uh, for the ladies in the audience, this represents your best chance at seeing the inside of the um, uh, men's toilet at Schiphol Airport. Um, you can see there's something in there. Uh, here's a uh, blow up. Uh, I, I actually, I went and made sure these flies were still there yesterday when I arrived at the airport. Uh, now, um, the, this was uh, an innovation introduced actually by a former economist who's, uh, I think this may be the best thing economists have ever done. <laughs> um, but, um, and um, so uh, the idea is, remember, a limited attention. So when men are um, taking care of business, um, they aren't paying very much attention to the task at hand. But if you give them a target, they will aim. And according to the people at Schiphol Airport, spillage has been reduced by 80%. Now, that fly has become my best example of a nudge. So wh what is a nudge? A nudge is some small feature of the environment that attracts our attention and influences our behavior. And it, it, it's important to stress that nudges work on humans, but not on econs. So econs choose optimally without nudges, but humans sometimes need a nudge. So we have a chapter on the principles of good choice architecture. I don't have time to talk about all of them today. But let me just give some examples of the first three principles. The first is defaults. So uh, we've heard the default option today is to speak Dutch, which I'm opting out of. Um, normally, a default option is just what happens if you do nothing. So the, uh, normally, what happens if you do nothing is nothing happens. but Sometimes, for example, you walk away from your computer. If you go away long enough, the screensaver comes on or the uh, computer locks itself. How long that takes is itself a default option that came on your computer and that most people never change. Now, the, the most important point about default options is that they are sticky. So whoever chooses the default option has a lot of power. Let me give two examples of this. The first, we have lots and lots of data about. Uh, in the US, we have, for the last 25 years ago or so, been switching over from a system of defined benefit pension plans to defined contribution plans, what um, in the US are known as 401k plans. And the employee has to join the plan and decide how much to save and how to invest the money. And um, some employees never get around to joining. Now, a simple solution to that is to change the default. So under the usual regime, when you are first eligible to join the plan, you get a big f pile of forms to fill out. And if you don't fill them out, you're not in. Uh, what some firms have done is switch to automatic enrollment. You get that same pile of forms, but the first page says, if you don't fill these out, we're going to enroll you at this savings level and at this investment plan. Now, um, this greatly speeds enrollment, but there's a downside, which is whatever the default options are, specifically the saving rate and the investment vehicle, those get sticky. And I'll talk about a solution to that in a minute. Let me give you another example with respect to organ donations. Um, in many countries, including the US and the Netherlands, if you want to 
make your organs available if you should die. You have to do something, sign some form. And countries vary in how difficult it is to find that form and turn it in. Some European countries uh, have adopted what's called presumed consent, which flips the default. Uh, so you're assumed to give your consent unless you opt out. Uh, Spain is the, actually the world's leader in uh, producing organs that are available for donation, and that one of the methods they use is presumed consent. That, that has some appeal, although it also, uh, some people object to this politically. Um, so I actually favor a third option, N neither opt in nor opt out, what I call mandated choice. And it's actually the system we use in Illinois, uh, where I live. Uh, so the way it works in Illinois is every few years you have to get your driver's license renewed and get your picture taken. And when you go to get your driver's license renewed, they ask you, do you want to be a donor, yes or no? You must answer that question to get your driver's license. So you, ca you can say no. You're free to say no, but you can't just say, uh, okay? So um, th now this has increased the proportion of people who uh, uh, agree to give their do organs to 68%. Uh, the nationwide in the U.S., it's 38%. This costs nothing. Um, now, I wrote a column about this in the New York Times uh, a couple months ago, and I mentioned that Steve Jobs had recently um, received a liver transplant and suggested that our goal should make it as easy to sign up to donate your organs as it is to, do to download an app on an iPhone, and um, nudged Steve Jobs to make an app available on the iPhone for people to sign up. Uh, Jobs didn't have to do anything. Two weeks later, I was approached by somebody uh, who said he read the column and was going to do this, and now there is uh, an app for the iPhone that you can click on and sign up in any state in the U.S. So that's yet another way that we could uh, make progress. Um, second principle, give feedback. People can't learn unless they get proper feedback. Um, one example is, suppose you're painting the ceiling at home. And ceilings are mostly painted white, so you have white paint and you're painting over white paint. It's very hard to see what, where you've painted. Some genius, maybe the same guy from Schiphol Airport, that uh, created a paint that goes on pink but then turns white. So you never miss a spot. It's because you get feedback. So here's another example of feedback. This is something, this little egg-shaped thing, is something called the ambient orb. It can be installed in people's homes, and uh, it normally just looks like this, but if you start using a lot of energy, it starts glowing red. Simply installing these in people's homes decreased energy use in peak periods by 40%. And energy is all about reducing uh, energy use at the peak because that's what determines how many power plants you have to build. So uh, here's another example. This is a study by uh, the great psychologist Bob Cialdini. They went around neighborhoods and they tried to encourage people to use less energy. Um, I think this was in a hot climate. Um, in places like Arizona, they have things called air conditioners. That I think it's a concept that's not well known in Holland. But 
uh, so they they had they went and they put these door hangers um, and encouraged people either to uh, save money or save the environment or be a good citizen, and the effect of this was zero. But th then they had a fourth condition where they said. Truthfully, your neighbors are using less power, you should too. That reduced energy use by 6%. And there's now uh, a company in the US called O Power that is producing, when you get your uh, utility bill, um, we now get these in uh, my home in Chicago, they tell you how much energy you're using compared to your neighbors. And providing that, not they don't name your neighbors, so there's no privacy concerns. They just say, Here, your, here's your utility bill, it's $300, your neighbor's bill was $200, so the average of your neighbors. Uh, it turns out, simply providing that information reduces usage by about two to six percent. It costs nothing. So the question is, why wouldn't we do things like that? There's a lot of low-hanging fruit, that uh, there's a lot of ways that we can alter behavior on climate change that cost nothing. We don't have to invent new kinds of uh, uh, energy sources. Uh, I mean, we should be investing in everything, but behavior change is one of the things we should be investing in. The, the first time I went to Paris, probably 20 years ago, um, and went into the metro, uh, you know, they give you one of these little tickets uh, and it has a magnetic stripe on one side and some writing on the other side. And I was looking at it, I didn't know which way to put it in the machine. So I'm an experimentalist, I put it in with the magnetic stripe up, that worked, and for the next 20 years I religiously did it that way. Then my wife and I spent four months living in Paris and since I was now a native, I was showing some friends around and how to use the metro. I said, now, it's very important when you go in the metro <laughs> to put the ticket in this way. And my wife starts laughing at me. And I said, what, you know, what are you laughing at? She says, well, actually, it makes no difference which way <laughs> you put this thing anyway works. And which is the only reason I had gotten it right for 20 years. Now, compare that to the parking garages in downtown Chicago. They work this way. You put your credit card in when you come in, and then when you're leaving, you drive up to the exit, you put your credit card back in, it takes some money, and the gate goes up. Now, there's four possible ways of putting the credit card into that machine. Exactly one of those four ways works. And you often find yourself behind some idiot. Um, not that this has ever happened to me, but you, you imagine, you put your card in, it, it comes out, you look, the gate is still down. Now, you have no idea what mistake you made, right? It could have been the wrong card, it could have gotten demagnetized, you could have put it in the wrong way. You don't actually remember which way you put it in. You put it back in, it could be the same way. And now, this has gotten so bad that if you go to the Chicago Symphony concerts, um, afterwards they have hired people just to stick the cards in <laughs> the right way or people would still be in that garage from last month's concert. And, so, um, so we need to expect error. Um, one p way people err is by not saving enough. Uh, in, in America, we now trust people to save enough for retirement. Many of them don't. Uh, <coughs> a colleague and I developed a method to help with this that we call Save More Tomorrow. And it's based, again, on basic psychology. One principle of psychology is we all have more willpower in the future than right now. So many of us in the room are planning to start diets 
on January 2nd. Not tonight. So, or not even at the coffee break, right? So, so we invited people to join up for a plan where their contributions to the pension plan go up every time they get a raise. And that happens automatically, and it keeps happening until they say stop, or until they hit some maximum. Now, in the first company where we did this, we tripled saving rates. And it's now available in uh, thousands of firms around uh, the US and is sort of spreading like those, like those flies. Um, now, uh, here are some examples of, of this principle in the healthcare domain. Um, you know, uh, when you go to fill your car up, if you have a diesel car, the nozzle is a different size to prevent you from putting the wrong fuel into your car. Um, it turns out, it used to be that there was a big problem in operations that uh, people would get the wrong anesthesia. There's a machine with lots of hoses, and if you connect the wrong hose to the wrong slot, the patient dies. Um, they solved that problem by making the nozzles incompatible. So it's just not possible to make that uh, mistake. Uh, an, another big problem in healthcare is compliance. There are many diseases where people are, uh, we, where the, we know the medicine, uh, we know the health to treat someone, but they, don't, they just don't do what they're supposed to do. Diabetes is uh, the classic example. Um, but the, it, for all kinds of things, getting people to take their medicine is a problem. Now, um, think about the choice architecture of designing a pill. The, the best, suppose you want to uh, manipulate the frequency with which people take the pills. The best sort of pill is one you take every morning. Because that's, the, well, the best would be a shot you get once and you're done. Right now, there's no compliance. Otherwise, the best is once a, once a day. Twice a day is bad. Three times a day is terrible. But once every other day is completely hopeless. Right? Is there any human that could master taking a pill every other day or every third day? That would be completely terrible. Once a week is not so bad. Some calcium supplements uh, are once a week. People, most of the people take it Sunday morning. That's not too bad. Uh, birth control pills are an interesting case in point because they're every morning and then you stop for a week. And so the way they were devised was there are placebos for seven days so that you don't lose the ritual of, of every day. Um, one of the uh, problems people have in hospitals is what's called a central line infection. So when a central line is inserted, there are certain procedures that should be followed. If they're followed, there's, uh, everything is fine. But if they're not followed, there can be an infection, and th this, these infections kill people and cost tons of money. It's been shown that if the, in the operating room they follow a simple checklist, you can reduce these infection rates to zero. Uh, interestingly, one of the items on the checklist is nurses are given permission to remind the doctors to wash their hands. And hand washing is key. Uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, covering up the body except for where the uh, line is going in is another key. But so uh, arming the nurses to remind the doctors to follow the rules is one of the things on the checklists. Um, again, this, there's no excuse for any hospital not to adopt these procedures, but many don't. Okay, uh, here, here's uh, something that uh, I've been pushing a lot since the book came out. It sounds quite boring, but I think it's actually quite important. 
And the idea is to change the way we do disclosure. Now, I, I don't know how the way it works here, but in the US, if I get a credit card, uh, I, I get 30 pages of fine print telling me all the rules of that credit card that I claim no one has ever read. Now, what we're suggesting is to supplement that with electronic disclosure. And the way it would work is, once a year, say, you would get an email with a file that had two kinds of information. One is your usage data. It would tell you how you've used that credit card, say, for the last year. And the other would be essentially a spreadsheet of all the ways that credit card can charge you for things. Now, uh, you could use this for credit cards, for mortgages, for cell phones. It, it, it's a perfectly general idea. Now, it's not that we think any humans would open those files. But what we think is that they would, with one click, be able to upload the files to third-party websites that would help them shop. And this would turn humans into econs as shoppers. Now, in fact, when we wrote the book, we predicted such websites would emerge. They've already emerged. So uh, I think I can skip this. Here's an example. There's a website in the US that's called Bill Shrink. Dot com, and um, they help people um, find a good uh, mobile calling plan. This is just a, a page uh, from their website. Um, here's another one. Um, it, it, it's not important, the details here. Uh, you could use the same for credit cards. One of the principles that I stress is that we as consumers should have the right to our own usage data. The, the suppliers have it. They know how many calls we've made, how many text messages we've sent, how many emails. Why shouldn't they share that data with us so that we can become intelligent shoppers? Now, one of the advantages of this kind of approach is that the alternative is regulation. And regulation is a never-ending game. So for example, I just read an article about in Australia, a couple of years ago, they regulated how much credit cards can charge merchants for using the credit card. And they cut those fees in half. And what's been happening over the last few years is credit cards are introducing more and more ingenious ways of charging you for things. So the, in America, we call this a whack-a-mole game, uh, where you knock something down and something else pops up. And uh, the kind of disclosure rules I'm talking about would end that game, because all the ways they charge you would be transparent. OK, let me end with a comment about the financial crisis. Uh, Alan Greenspan gave a famous mea culpa speech um, where he said he was shocked, like the character in Casablanca, he was shocked uh, that the people in the financial markets were not paying enough attention to counterparty risk. And he was also shocked that um, uh, the, the smartest financial institutions in the world were viewing mortgage-backed securities as a steal. And uh, in his world view, they were econs, e super econs, and wouldn't make this sort of mistake. So <clears throat> here's my take on the financial crisis. And I, I think two of the mistakes I've been talking about today are important to understanding what, what happened. And one is bounded rationality. And so the crisis started with people 
in places like Las Vegas and Phoenix and Miami taking out mortgages that were complicated and which they could only really pay back if real estate prices kept going up. And it's not surprising really to anybody um, that some people will not understand a complicated mortgage. So the bounded rationality of the borrowers is not surprising. What's surprising is that this bounded rationality worked all the way, it's all the way up to the CEOs of major financial institutions. And what they didn't understand is what their traders were doing. So um, the, we've, you know, you have companies like Bear Stearns and uh, AIG and Lehman Brothers um, that were essentially brought down or um, greatly shrunk by the behavior of a very small part of the organization that was engaged in trading practices that the CEO couldn't understand. So we have bounded rationality all the way from the bottom to the top. The second key thing I would point to is self-control problems. And again, it, was, it started the crisis with people, most of these mortgages were refinances. And people would use the low interest rates to get out a new mortgage that, on the increased value of their home in order to build a big addition and put in a big television set or some such. And there was a lot of keeping up with the Joneses. So my neighbor puts an addition onto his house and puts in a big TV, and I need to put an addition on my house and put in a bigger TV. Because, you know, thou shall not have a smaller TV than thou neighbor. And um, now again, the same problem occurred with CEOs. There was, there was earnings envy. And on the golf course, you had one CEO bragging about how much money he was making selling credit default swaps. And um, others were saying, you know, you're not doing that. And, uh, you know, I'm making hundreds of millions. Why aren't you doing that? So we had keeping up with the Joneses again from the bottom to the top. So what can we do about this? I don't think the answer is heavy-handed government regulation. And the reason is that the regulators wouldn't be capable of regulating. There, Bob Rubin, the former Treasury Secretary, who was serving as the Vice Chairman of Citigroup, has admitted never having heard the term liquidity put until he discovered that Citicorp had lost $50 billion selling liquidity puts. Now, they don't come any smarter than Bob Rubin, and I gave a talk in Washington last February where, to the Treasury Department, and I asked, who here is ready to take over running Citibank? And no one raised their hand. And I gave the same talk in London a couple weeks later and asked the same question about the Royal Bank of Scotland and got the same answer. So we, we don't want bureaucrats trying to run banks that were too complicated for the CEOs to run. I think the answer has to be in better disclosure. Again, electronic. And here's the needle I think we have to try and thread. We need to get the organizations to disclose enough so that the regulators can monitor what they're doing and the market can monitor what they're doing. Right? If I'm an investor in AIG, I want to know how, what their exposure is to uh, credit default obligations um, so that I don't invest in that company. But we can't ask them to disclose so much that they can no longer make a living. Now, that's the goal. I mean, the devil's in the details, as it always is. But I think that's the goal we should be shooting for. 
One principle I've been urging is too big to fail means too big to hide. So the bigger you are, the more you got to tell us. And, uh, you know, some little bank in a country town, I don't care what they're doing. Um, if uh, it's Citibank and we're going to have to bail them out if they go under, then they got to tell us at least what their leverage is and what exposure they have to systematic risk. Okay, let me conclude. We are all humans. Uh, we need all the help we can get. It's possible to improve choices without restricting options. Don't use bans and mandates. Just nudge, and you can even do it in Dutch. <laughs> Thank you very much.